Okay. Hi, everyone. It's Matt. Uh, in this pre-lecture video, we're going to be talking a little bit about the abuses of statistics. So, so far in class, we've been uh, thinking a little bit about calculating various things. Uh, now that we can uh, calculate a little bit, uh, it's good to take a little bit of time uh, to talk about how one might interpret uh, these different things. Uh, the idea being that this can be done uh, well, but this can also be done badly. Uh, so just to get things started off, there's a few uh, kind of comical inspirational quotes uh, in here. Uh, in particular, maybe let's look at the last one. Uh, so some people use statistics uh, as a drunken man uses lampposts uh, for support uh, rather than illumination. Uh, so the idea here is that instead of deciding, oh, I would like the statistics to support this claim, and then providing any evidence to support your claim, uh, perhaps it would be better to be a little bit impartial and observe the statistics and see what it can illuminate for you. Uh, so uh, getting into things, we don't want to present data in a misleading way, uh, but data could be represented in a misleading way. This could be because of ignorance. Maybe the person presenting the data just doesn't know. Uh, perhaps carelessness, maybe it was done quickly. Or maybe there's some kind of personal objective. Uh, perhaps the person works for a particular company and uh, the company tells them they're required to achieve uh, some kind of inference about their product. This is uh, somewhere between unethical and flat out evil. Um, there are a couple ways this can happen, um, that statistics can be abused. Um, and the idea here is that we want uh, you uh, not to <laughs> make these mistakes uh, yourself, uh, but also you want to be able to recognize these things uh, when you're reading articles or newspaper or seeing things that someone else has reported. You want to be able to recognize these uh, particular kinds of issues like misleading graphs or bad samples. Uh, so we'll go through each of each of these eight here. Let's start with bad samples. Okay, uh, so one big goal in sampling is to select a, a sample that represents the population. That's maybe the only goal <laughs> in sampling. Uh, for example, uh, you can have a bad sample if it is too small. Uh, you can imagine if you wanted to know something about all of BCIT students, and you only ask the two of them who happens to be standing next to you in line or something. Uh, this, uh, your data probably can't be used um, at all. It's not reliable and it's certainly not representative. Uh, even if your sample is not super small, if it's a reasonable size, the sample might be biased, so it might not be representative. Uh, so for example, you could ask yourself, about the percentage of BCIT students that are female. Uh, if you were to maybe take a look at just one particular class, that would not be representative of the whole. Uh, it's easy to believe that um, one class versus another might have a different uh, balance here. So I mean, if you look at something like nursing uh, versus maybe something like CIT, uh, C-I-T, you're likely to get uh, widely different results. Um, last one here is self-selected survey. So respondents, people responding to your survey are deciding whether or not to be included. Uh, this is another way in which your sample can uh, not be the best. Sometimes this is difficult to avoid. So just from my personal experience, I've run at UBC some student surveys about how long students are reviewing their 
midterm after they get their midterm back. You can imagine that uh, I send out the survey by email. Uh, students are contacted in the class and the survey says, hey, how long did you spend reviewing uh, your midterm? Well, the only students data that I got are the ones who responded to my email. And so I'm missing out on the particular students who are maybe uh, have no desire to respond to their email, don't check their email, aren't very good at checking their email. Uh, you can imagine that maybe uh, the students who aren't responding are taking a little bit less time to review their midterm, perhaps. We don't know, but um, perhaps this sample is not the best. Uh, sometimes for ethical reasons, I mean, your sample is maybe that's the best you can do, but uh, in general, we want our sample to be as uh, representative as possible of the whole population. Uh, another thing that can happen is if your sample is just flawed. So this example here, a study done of occupation versus age of death, draws the conclusion that students die at an early age. Uh, is it true that uh, you're a dangerous profession, that being a student uh, will be, you'll be more likely to expire as a student than by doing something else? Uh, I think that's probably a bit suspect. That's probably not true. The thing that's going on here is that most students are young. So any students that uh, happen at all to die uh, do so at an early age. It's not necessarily the fact that um, the being a student is dangerous. It's just most students are at an early age. Okay, so let's look now at um, what we're going to call distorted percentages. So you can um, be a little bit misleading in your data depending on how you report percentages. So let's consider the following news headline. So this is an actual headline in the Vancouver Moon uh, saying average property taxes in Vancouver increased by $100, whereas in rural areas it's only up $40. Uh, and the moon proclaims that Vancouver residents are screwed again. Uh, so this is one particular news article talking about property prices. Uh, this smaller paper, uh, Karemio's Echo, uh, this is a small sort of local uh, or so small rural area outside of Vancouver. They have a publication saying property tax is up by 10%. Whereas in Vancouver, it's only up by 5%. Why should we uh, pay more? So both of these uh, came out at the same time, both of these news articles. They're claiming exactly opposite things. Vancouver thinks that uh, they are paying more, and the rural areas think that they are paying more. Uh, who's, who's right? What's going on? Which, which claim is correct? Uh, the thing is that a lot of information is missing from these two statistics. So if we were to um, maybe look things out a little more carefully, we can see what's going on. Uh, so for example, uh, tax last year in Vancouver, maybe average uh, property tax people are paying in Vancouver is about $2,000, whereas in Kremios, it's uh, only $400. And so this is kind of where our difficulty will come. So uh, in Vancouver, we apparently have an increase of $100 versus an increase of $40. However, uh, if we look at the um, percentages, we'll see something different. So the total tax this year in Vancouver is up $100 from last year to $2,100, whereas uh, here, we're up from 400 to 440. So that's uh, what Vancouver's saying. Uh, but the percent increase here, this one is only a 5% increase, 100 of 2,000. Whereas this $40 of 400 is a 10% increase. So by only displaying one of these two columns, uh, you can be quite misleading about what's going on. Uh, in terms of what you should do in practice, well, probably you should display both. 
probably you should display all of this information because the fact that the average property tax in Vancouver is higher uh, is kind of distorting the uh, increase versus the percentage. Okay, so uh, the third thing that could happen is uh, displaying some information, but not all of the information. So for example, the quote, 90% of all our cars sold in this country in the last 10 years are still on the road. Uh, that sounds really great. Should I go and buy a car from this manufacturer? Well, if it happens to be the case that the manufacturer uh, has sort of just sold 90% of their cars in the past three years, maybe they weren't making very many cars prior to three years ago, and now they've just started making tons of cars. Uh, those cars are only three years old. And so <laughs> what happens to all the cars before that? It's, uh, the, all the cars before three years from now are probably broken. So these, uh, I shouldn't buy this car. It's not going to last long, uh, but it's a little bit misleading here. Uh, them claiming it will last 10 years. Uh, so that's partial pictures, um, which is uh, may or may not be deliberate, uh, but you can imagine deliberate uh, distortions that are coming here. Uh, so for example, uh, Travel Magazine uh, published some results showing that among car rental companies, Avis was the winner of a survey of people who rent cars. Uh, but then when their competitor Hertz requested detailed information, uh, they the, they somehow lost the survey responses. They disappeared uh, somehow, and the magazine survey coordinator resigned. Um, so it uh, sounds here like uh, whatever survey data they had didn't support the claim that they make. Uh, it's a little bit fishy that, oh no, our data has gone missing. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to be a little bit careful about who... Uh, who is reporting uh, and what their claims are uh, if they have some kind of vested interest. Uh, let's move now to leading and loaded questions. So this could happen uh, either deliberately or completely by accident. So you can imagine asking some questions that are leading or biased. Uh, an example of this is something like, do you contribute to charity every month? Uh, the way it's asked, uh, just based on human psychology, people are more likely to say yes uh, to this. You're more likely, uh, people are just more likely to respond true to this because they want to. Uh, they want to be able to agree that they contribute to charity every month. Maybe they contribute to charity seven months out of 12 in the year and figure, oh no, I, I, I contribute to charity. I'd like to say yes to this. Um, whereas if you ask just the question, how often do you contribute to charity, uh, where they can select how often they do, that will be a little, a little less biased. Uh, it's not that the people are uh, evil or lying on purpose. It's just uh, something about human psychology that makes us want to agree uh, with these kinds of statements. Um, that one you maybe wouldn't know right away. Uh, hopefully you won't be asking sort of loaded questions in your surveys, something like, do you support the development of atomic weapons that could kill millions of innocent people? Uh, <laughs> so here uh, you're asking really just about, do you support development of atomic weapons? To go on to say, oh, it'll kill millions of innocent people, a lot of people are probably going to respond by saying, no, I don't support the death of millions of people. Why would, why would you think that? Um, whereas that's not really what you're talking about here. Really, you're just talking about development. Uh, so maybe you should remove this last part here uh, to make it less of a loaded question. Uh, that one's maybe uh, kind of belligerent. <laughs> But this, you can have loaded questions quite unintentionally. Again, because of human psychology, it's a little bit surprising. So if you ask the question like, would you say that traffic contributes more or less to pollution than industry? That's one way you could phrase a question. Or you could phrase a question, would you say that industry contributes more or less to pollution than traffic? Uh, interestingly, uh, if you ask these questions 
to a bunch of people, you'll get a lot of no's to both. Uh, again, something about human psychology um, makes us answer in this way. Uh, so rather than some kind of comparison, uh, you might ask something like, how much do you think traffic contributes to pollution? How much do you think industry contributes to pollution? To get people to separate those out in their mind. Okay, so let's move on to now misleading graphs. Uh, so uh, graphs like par, bar graphs and pie charts, uh, they can be used in different ways to either exaggerate or de-emphasize the true nature of data to give some non-representative picture. Um, one easy way to do this is with graphs whose vertical scales do not start at zero. Um, this isn't always a problem if you're careful and you have error bars and everything's well explained, but in graphs that are meant to be looked at quickly by the general public, I still probably wouldn't do this. Uh, we can take a little bit of, uh, we can take a little look at this example here on provincial personal income taxes uh, in Canada based on these different provinces here. You can see BC somehow is the lowest in Canada and Quebec is all the way over here. Uh, this is uh, an astounding difference. Uh, it looks, if you tried to kind of measure this, and see how big this is, uh, it looks like Quebec is paying something like six times the income tax. Uh, somehow I find that hard to believe uh, <laughs> that income tax in Quebec is six times larger uh, than in BC. Uh, the issue here is that this axis here is it doesn't start at zero. Uh, and we actually don't know what it starts at. Uh, moreover, there's actually no scale here. Uh, this difference, I mean, it's something, but we don't know what it is. Is it $5? I mean, if it's $5, uh, then we're basically all just paying the same uh, personal income tax. So what was the point of this graph? Uh, it's really emphasizing this difference that isn't really a difference. Uh, so that's sort of one extreme example. Let's look at the next example uh, here for salaries, people with bachelor's degrees versus high school degrees. And this one's a little bit better. As you can see, it at least labels the thing. Uh, so if uh, you're to look at this first graph here, at least you can see ah, this, the bottom is at 20,000, and these numbers here, 24, um, 40, and 4,500 are labeled here. And so yeah, if you look at this for a little bit of time, you can say, ah, that looks a little bit like a difference of about 16,100. Um, and on this graph, it looks like a pretty huge difference. Uh, again, this graph is properly labeled and someone could figure this out. But if you put this in the newspaper or something, uh, and this graph is supposed to be read kind of quickly and easily, uh, perhaps you might prefer this one which gives a more kind of uh, measured difference here between these two bars. This here makes it look like a huge difference. Uh, I'm not saying 16,000 isn't a lot, but um, it's not like the people with bachelor's degrees are making like five times more. Okay, uh, the last thing, uh, second last thing, that we're going to think about is uh, pictographs. So pictographs can maybe be some fun way uh, to try and use drawings to represent things. Uh, you may have seen this before, like money bags or stacks of coins or uh, cows or barrels or houses. Uh, but they can be misleading. So you can look at this, uh, these boxes, uh, I guess these are boxes of money. Uh, <laughs> You could take a look at these here, and you've got a small one here and a big one here. And the thing is, uh, is this how much how much more money have we got over here uh, versus over here? So in the big one, we've kind of doubled 
looks like we've doubled the length, the width, and the height. So we've doubled the length, width, and the height. Uh, so I guess in some sense, uh, this piece right here is double this piece. But in terms of just being humans and being used to existing in three dimensions, we kind of are maybe naturally going to think about the volume. And the volume here is actually increased by a factor of eight. You could fit eight of these little boxes into this big box. And so while this is trying to maybe demonstrate that it's doubled, it's blowing it way out of proportion by including uh, length, width, and height instead of just uh, one dimension of something being twice as much. Uh, we kind of have the same problem over here with these money bags uh, in that maybe the height here has doubled, uh, but the area has increased by a larger factor. Uh, and I mean, it looks a little bit strange. Am I supposed to, like, is, is this, there's no money in there, in the top bit. I mean, how am I supposed to interpret uh, this picture? Do I take, like, the volume inside the bag? Do I take just the length of the height? Uh, it's not really clear what it means, and it can be misleading. Okay, uh, so the last part is that um, the nature of numbers, uh, precise numbers. Sometimes people use precise numbers with the idea of trying to be a bit misleading. Um, like, look at this number here. If I say mean annual salary is $25,532.22, uh, you're probably thinking, oh, wow, uh, that's such a precise number. That's probably uh, pretty accurate. It's down to the penny. We don't even, I don't, we don't even use those anymore. So, uh, is that, is that really better? Probably someone just made some kind of average, uh, and this is the number they got. But, I mean, there's probably a lot of uncertainty in whatever calculation they did. Uh, so instead of reporting like that, is that really better than saying something like uh, 25,000, maybe plus or minus 500? That's probably more likely what's going on here. We think it's somewhere around 25,000. Uh, but I mean, as it stands, we're not really sure uh, where this number came from. And so while it's very precise, uh, we don't really know if it's accurate or not. Okay, and then at the end, we just have this uh, funny comic demonstrating this idea. Uh, so this is Dilbert. Dilbert's here talking, I guess, to his bosses and saying, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made this one up. And look at how many decimal places there are here. It's, it it's, feels pretty legit, but he just made it up. It's not legit at all. Uh, Dilbert goes on to say that studies have shown that uh, accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones we make up. <laughs> to which the reply is, how many studies showed that? Dilbert responds by saying 87. Uh, you almost want to believe him because 87 is such a precise number. Uh, he must have got it from somewhere good. Uh, okay, so that's uh, precise numbers. So hopefully you can yourself be aware uh, and watch for these sorts of things when you're uh, reading. Uh, of course, when you're reporting and gathering your own data, reporting your own statistics, you obviously don't want to do these things yourself. Uh, there's a small D2L quiz on this kind of stuff. So go ahead over there and give that a shot. Um, this kind of, uh, this particular uh, video lecture here isn't going to be on the exam, but it is going to be on the quiz. Uh, but it's just something that's important uh, that you know when we start working with data. All right, that's great. We'll see you all in class.